Hello, Sansar. I'm so happy to have you here in this series of calls that, as you know, are trying to show to the people that the people that we admire, the, the, the great entrepreneurs, have been in really tough situation in the past and has been the way how they saw the situation instead of a problem as an opportunity that made them success. And in your particular case, we share a lot of beautiful things like YPO and Harvard, but we also share a crazy fact for an entrepreneur that we both grow and born in very, I don't want to say crazy, but complicated places. I'm in Venezuela and you in Afghanistan. I think by far you're more complex than me. We are in the same way, but oh my God. So I think this interview is going to be amazing, amazing. So as you know, please, we want to know, brother, uh, how you start at the beginning, even the school, the first things, the first flag that, tell, that let you know, you know what, this is what I want to do. So thanks again, my friend, to be here. And please tell me your story. Sure. Thank you, Ricardo, for, for your time. And I'm so honored and pleased you know, to be a part of this. Um, so to go back to the beginning, um, my father's from Afghanistan and my mother's from the United States. Um, they met uh, when they were studying in medical school in the University of Washington in Seattle in the United States. And that's where I was born as well. And then um, when I was four years old or about five years old, um, they did a migration to Afghanistan. And I call it a reverse migration because that's when the Russians came to Afghanistan and everyone was leaving the country. You know, millions and millions of refugees were leaving Afghanistan, but my parents moved back. And so we lived on the border um, in a city called Peshawar uh, with, uh, 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 and they would go back and forth to, to Afghanistan. And they were helping the war victims. So they were doctors and they were treating a lot of the, um, the patients and the injured. Um, they ran a clinic, they ran a university. Um, a well, lot of things. Well, 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 one second. So this is even more complicated because the big enemy of the crazy bad guys in Afghanistan is the U.S. So, and you are a, an American guy. And, and even your, your mother is American. Yes. So it's, oh my God. So this is amazing also because I know that people that study medicine is a, is, is, is a, it's not a business. It's a real commitment. It's a life commitment. And it's so noble that your family even though they were living in the U.S. that we know that is a fantastic place to live, they go back to, so, and it was for, for the situation that they feel that they need to go back or what was the reason to really go back? Exactly. It was, it was out of, um, I think, a, a, a need to help uh, people. So yeah, people in the medical world, especially, you know, see how many lives you can impact and help and save. And so given, you know, it was a very difficult war, um, over a million Afghans were killed. Um, so again, this is back when the Soviets came, the, the Russians came. And the, um, uh, my parents were working on the relief side in Peshawar. Um, and that's where I went to school. I went to a, a British medium school in Peshawar called Beacon House. Um, and I grew up, I went to um, uh, uh, then uh, high school in Islamabad in, 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 in Pakistan. Um, and then um, that's when the Taliban first came uh, uh, to, to Afghanistan. And uh, back then, uh, it wasn't, you know, the U.S. was never you know, a big enemy. It was very opposite, actually. The U.S. was considered heroes uh, because every Afghan knows that the turning point in the war in Afghanistan, when the Russians occupied Afghanistan, was when the U.S. gave these, you know, handheld Stinger missiles where they would chase the, the Russian airplanes using heat-seeking technology and then blow them up. And so thousands of Russians' uh, uh, airplanes and, you know, uh, were, were, were destroyed during that time. Um, and uh, that's when the, the turning uh, came. That's when they, they, they saw they couldn't win this war and eventually um, they left. And when they left, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, that's when the civil war uh, started. And there was a war between Afghans themselves, which, you know, many different countries had different hands in it. Um, but uh, that's when my family, you know, took a step back in Pakistan for a little time during that time and during the time of the first time the Taliban came. It was a very difficult time. Um, and uh, I went to university at uh, that time. So I went to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh, UPenn, um, and I started work for Merrill Lynch in New York City. Actually, I lived and worked on Wall Street uh, in, wow, in New York. So nice. uh, and uh, that was then when, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the government in Afghanistan changed and the Russians went to 
uh, are not the Russians. The Americans then went to Afghanistan, um, you know, to try to find Osama bin Laden and, you know, to, to try to topple the Taliban government at that time. And they set up a new government with Karzai. So my father then worked as the deputy minister of health uh, in Karzai's government. Um, and he called me up when I was at Merrill Lynch. And I'd only been one year in New York. <laughs> can you he help said, me? <laughs> oh, what? He said, you know, your country can, can, can use you more than New York. Wow. Um, and so I sold everything I had and I just got on an airplane and I moved to, to Kabul, to Afghanistan. So this was early, you know, 2005, 2006. Uh, in those days, there was never any suicide attacks. There was, you know, security was very good. And I joined a venture capital firm. Um, and we wanted to do venture capital in Afghanistan. You know, this is a post-war economy and everyone's building up. There's a lot of, you know, interest and there was Amazing. a lot of optimism and positivity. And so I'm actually met with 300 different businesses and entrepreneurs that they wanted, you know, financing from venture capital uh, to go about it. And then things started to change. The security started changing. The first suicide attack happened. There was demonstrations. Um, and the, the, you know, the, what the investors realized that it's no longer really a post-war country. It's actually going back into a war. And so that fund closed down and I, I joined the U.S. government. And I was working um, on, a, on a program uh, to uh, organize uh, all of the um, kind of the, the cases in Afghanistan, criminal cases and civil cases for, for the government. So I worked um, from the U.S. State Department on a program um, in Afghanistan um, where we had all the different databases and combined them into one single system. So whether it's the courts or the prosecutors or the police or the military or intelligence, everyone had one system that they could they could use. Um, my background is computer engineering. That's what I studied at, at UPenn. So this is something that I that I really enjoyed doing. But working for the government, coming from you know the private sector and venture capital, very 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 quickly I got frustrated. You know, so much bureaucracy, so much difficulty. Um, uh, you know, working in government, and I saw you know just these horrendous things. You know, the the females uh, prison they would open it up at night for a brothel. You know, the, the crazy things that you could never imagine. It was just so difficult, you know, to see so much, um, uh, uh, you know, bureaucracy. I, I know I'm, I'm a very active guy. I want to, you know, get things done. And so I, um, I left that position and I started my own firm. Uh, I started a company called Afghanistan Financial Services. So I, I really enjoyed what I was doing in venture capital and I really enjoyed technology. And so we did a lot of systems. Uh, financial. Sansar, Sansar, one second. So at this time you were married, you had kids or not yet? So yes. Had... So when I got to Kabul, I got married, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to a wonderful, um, uh, you know, uh, lady. I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted, but I hadn't had kids yet. <laughs> I think I started my first, uh, we had our first uh, child um, a few years later. Um, now I have five children, thankfully. <laughs> and so uh, I've been working hard. We got <laughs> that. But back then, no, it was just you know my wife and I, uh, and we, um, we we traveled a bit out of Afghanistan, uh, you know, to just get a you know breath of fresh air every now and then. But a lot of it was focused on kind of rebuilding the economy, um, you know, during that time. And starting a business, you know, in any country is difficult, uh, right? I, I was taught. Um, uh, I did a, a distance MBA from Warwick uh, in the UK, and they said, you know, 70% of all new businesses fail, uh, right? Because, you know, it's difficult, right? You, you run out of cash or capital or exactly. financing or competition or whatnot. There's so many, you know, a million different obstacles for a new entrepreneur. Um, and so I, I said, you know, let, let's try it. But in Afghanistan, it was particularly difficult. And um, difficult finding good people, given finding clients, um, you know, simple things things were, were very, very challenging uh, in, in Afghanistan. Um, and once we had this financial services company, um, you know, someone said, oh, I heard Sanzar, you know, you're doing financial services, can you do my taxes for me? And so we ended up doing a lot of tax work in Afghanistan. Then they said, oh, you're doing my taxes, can you do some, you know, uh, uh, HR work for our payroll as well? And then, oh, can you do some legal work? And so slowly, slowly, we ended up doing a lot of different services, professional services for different organizations. Got it, got it. And uh, in a few years, in about five years, we had served 700 international organizations. Uh, we had 350 employees, mostly accountants oh and God. auditors. And, um, and all, yeah. these, all these people is in, is in Afghanistan or is out of Afghanistan? All of them were in Afghanistan. Um, and, and one, more, uh, one more thing, you, you know what, that, that 
I really love from your story. Bueno, first of all, I have no idea about all this. It's amazing. Um, um, but I have also, I don't know if passion or willing or a goal to really invite my entrepreneurial friends, smart guys, to do something in the political arena because it's exactly what you said. So it's so frustrating. It's so crazy. How bad is this field in the politics? But in the other hand, if we don't do something in this field, it's affecting so much the economy and life of so many people in a country. So it's a, it's a, it's a so complicated situation. I have a, a, a person that I met in Macedonia. This was many years ago. And this, this person was the minister of um, external something. And um, yeah. he was educating the US and kind of like you, uh, the president of, of uh, Macedonia at this time, this was probably six or seven years ago, called him. He was in Chicago having his beautiful career. And he became, he, the, you know, the, the, this, uh, this leader, I think it's the, the tourist something or promoter for the, for the tourism in, in the country. So, but to my point, I remember that I saw a huge change in Macedonia, but it's because instead of just having one like you, there was kind of a, a, a politic, like let's bring the best talent and at the same time, and together, because what I really believe, the system, the political system is so complicated and so bureaucratic and so another world that if you are alone, you're not going to make it. But if there is a bunch of great kids with a good idea, with this spirit to make a change, I really believe it's possible. And you know what? I'm, I'm not going to stop pushing all my friends like you to generate this, what I call political entrepreneurs. I really believe we need a new generation of people that really jump in the field with all this learning and knowledge that they, you know, managing a company can be useful managing a, a, a company. But, but this is so interesting that you have been there and, and, and then you, but I can imagine that. So another thing that I saw is that it's, it's a, the typical thing in business. So being there in a super complicated situation, you have been seeing so many opportunities and creating and bringing value to serve all these. So this is why, because when, when you start talking so days ago, you told me that you have these holding companies. Oh, wow, it's so complicated, but now I understand. So there is everything to do and, and there is not so many professional people with this passion for the country, so beautiful. Exactly, exactly. And, and so th that's exactly right. There, there was actually a, a similar initiative in Afghanistan where they brought you know, young, talented, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and, and you know, uh, Western educated, uh, you know, uh, people to Afghanistan. And it had, you know, advantages and disadvantages. Um, but there, there's so much that, you know, government can learn from, from entrepreneurship and from business, from, you know, customer service. So you know, you're here to serve the people. Um, and in a lot of countries, it's the other way around. They think that, um, you know, the, the customers, uh, you know, they, they treat them very badly, the, the, the citizens. Uh, but the, the government is, 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 the whole purpose of the government is to serve the people. So that customer service mentality is one thing. Balancing budgets, um, making sure that, you know, minimize expenses, um, you know, waste, fraud and abuse, um, proper HR management. I mean, there's so many, you know, vital lessons uh, from the, the business world that, that uh, haven't been, you know, properly, uh, you know, applied in many governments, least of all the Afghan government. And, and that's what we're seeing more and more actually today, um, yeah. the results of that. Sansar, one question, because your father and your mother are both doctors. So yes. it's, not, it's not entrepreneurs, are doctors. Where you get, where do you feel that you get this inspiration? Because I think that we entrepreneurs are, are very strange animals because it's, it's hard to live in this world, you know, doing, it's, it's a lot of brave and maybe a little bit crazy, you know, to really start just with a dream and make it. So in your family, you saw some, because remember that part of the, the idea of these uh, uh, stories is to uh, show people and, and make people reflect Okay, where I get this, or how can I get inspired? So, where do you feel you get inspired to start making companies? Because you didn't study business, you study engineer, and your family were more in a passion for health and more than you know. Where do you get that? Exactly, and and not only were they in a passion for medicine and for health, they they also encouraged me to go that same path. A, a lot of uh, you know Afghans, their preferred opportunity is. Is, is medicine. Um, actually, in Afghanistan, when you graduate from high school, you take a college entrance exam. And uh, automatically, you know, the, the highest scoring uh, students, 
they are um, entered into medical school. They don't even ask them, do you want to go to medical school? That that's, that means number one. Then number two, the next scoring, they go to engineering. And then the last one, they're you know, teachers and, and others. So basically, if you fail the exam, you end up anything else. Just automatically, that's because they think that that's what people want. But that's not what I wanted um, you know, at all. Even my parents, when I was taking you know, statistics classes, they were like, you know, health statistics is also a very good field. Or I was taking, you know, management, and there were, you know, healthcare management is also, you know, anything related to. But by, by the way, Penn State, Penn State is one of the best in medicine, I, I, in my understanding. So, you, you Penn. So there's, yeah, there's Penn State and U Penn. Um, U Penn is also yeah, they have a great medical school. Um, they have a great business school. Wharton is known to be one of the best business schools in the world. And so I think I got a little bit of that probably from, from Wharton. Uh, I really enjoyed the classes there, the professors there, uh, a little bit uh, of that, a little bit working for, for Merrill Lynch. Um, working, uh, when I was at Merrill Lynch, I worked with stock exchanges. And I even realized, you know, stock exchanges, you know, I always thought of it somehow that it was a government thing or something like that. But no, stock exchanges are actually a business themselves. And the Philadelphia Stock Exchange was actually... Uh, uh, partially started and owned by Merrill Lynch. And so I started thinking more and more uh, along those lines. But in terms of my own inspiration, um, I think I, I really uh, probably lack patience. That's what it is. And when I work for anyone else or for the government or something else like that, it's very, very difficult for me because I just want to jump to the action. Uh, and I want to, I want to see the results. And so mm -hmm. if I'm Uh, uh, you know, uh, if I'm held up for reasons that are not within my control, it's very, very difficult. So being an entrepreneur, um, that motivation uh, helps a lot. The last thing I'll say about that is probably optimism. I have this unbelievable, uncanny, I think, ability to be completely optimistic in the most incredible, difficult situations. And I think for entrepreneurs, that's something that's very, very important. Um, if you don't have optimism, anything that happens like, oh, forget about it you know can't do it you know too bad you know that's it doesn't work out all right are, I'll try something. You, are, you are really the perfect profile for entrepreneur it's, <laughs> it's, it's true optimism uh, uh, and also this this willing to to make these things so make this happen execution is also very important as an entrepreneur it's true it's true wow it's, so it's, keep keep going and in afghanistan it's, it's it's even worse so as we grew as a company we were doing you know more and more financial things um and we were doing a lot of audits and we had the most difficult situations. We, we audited, you know, small firms, 70% of their receipts and paperwork was fraudulent. They would go to any shop and the shop would give them, instead of a receipt, would give them a blank piece of, uh, a blank, you know, form and say, okay, you fill out your own receipt, whatever you think it was. So instead of a generator, you know, uh, they would say a generator is, you know, $50,000, they would write $100,000 and then go get reimbursement, you know, from their, from their business or something. So, you know, a huge amount of, uh, you know, difficulty doing, you know, simple things. My favorite story is actually about fuel. Fuel, there were so many ways that people could, could steal fuel. So when we're trying to audit uh, for our own business and for other businesses, fuel. Um, one time we had this one client, an American, he was like, you know, that's it. You know, every time we get fuel and we end up getting less and we don't, you know, I, someone's stealing from me. I don't know who it is, but this time I'm going to make sure that I don't lose any fuel. And so he sat in the tanker, you know, in the truck himself. And he drove with the, with the driver all the way up to the, the place. He filled up the tanker full with fuel. And he watched, you know, this many liters or gallons uh, is going to be filling up the tank. And then he sat back and he watched the truck all the way to his compound. And he took out the fuel and he's watching again. And again, he has less fuel. And he's like, what happened? I was with the fuel the whole time. Where did my fuel go? Who took my fuel? Who stole it? You know, who did it? And we're the auditors, right? And so we have to make sure, you know, what's the financial side is going on. So we looked and looked and looked. Finally, we found out when we opened up the fuel tanker, we looked inside, the truck driver was putting mattresses, like sponges, these big bed mattresses inside the truck. And so when the fuel would go in, the mattress would absorb the fuel. And then he would go home and he would take the fuel out of the sponges to oh take the God. fuel for himself. <laughs> wow. So, you know, just, you know, the most absurd things. Yes, you know, there were attacks and there was, you know, rockets. And, you know, I missed several, you know, we had our own employees that, you know, had all kinds of stories. I would, you know, travel around the country. Um, but it was really, you know, at the end of the day, um, uh, 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 an experience of incredible amount of, Um, I think optimism that you have to say, all right, 
it's going to work out. You know, this will pass as well. We just have to keep going and keep going and not stop. So beautiful. And, and Sazar, one question. Do you have, because I would love to see you as a president of your country. There is any way that you jump on this field because you have everything. You, are, you have this positive attitude. You have this um, a, a stress for execute and make things happen. So you are like a, a, an electric motor, so ready to jump. So have you ever considered to, to run or to do something in a, maybe in, in a different time? Because I know that right now it's like a mess. Yes. Um, I mean, I, uh, my father and my, my in-laws, they've been involved in politics and I've been able to see from a distance, you know, a lot of the, the difficulties. So my father was then the advisor to the president, you know, senior advisor for many years. Then he was the ambassador to, from Afghanistan to Qatar. In, in Doha um, during the negotiations and uh, uh, with between the US government and the Afghan government. Um, he was also briefly the chief of staff for the president uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and and I, I saw, you know, there's so much mudslinging uh, in, in Afghanistan, um, at least in Afghanistan, maybe in other countries, I, I assume it's similar as well. Mudslinging in the sense that, you know, there's character assassinations and there's a lot of different things. And, you know, yes, I'm an entrepreneur and I have a lot of energy and optimism, but in the back of my head, I still have a little bit of that engineering. And I like, you know, one plus one equals two. It needs to be clear, straight, and, and you know, not to make compromises. Yes. And, and in policy, for I get it. Two plus two. And politics is all seven, about- Seven, 11, or one. <laughs> Politics is all about compromising and deals. And, know. you know, it's not one plus one equals two. You know it's what I mean? So it's, right? not, it's, it's not finance. Um, I and that's, I so it's very, very difficult uh, for me. So I, I don't think I'll ever, you know, be involved in, in, in politics. But in terms of helping people, definitely. I, I, I want to serve people. I want to help people as much as possible. If that means, you know, bringing food, if that means bringing healthcare. And so in August, when the Taliban came, Uh, to Afghanistan, you know, I had had a I had a choice. Um, I had a choice to make. Should I just you know pack up and leave and you know abandon the country? You know, we, we set up 10 different businesses, uh, you know, over over the years in, in Afghanistan, uh, and just say you know it's too difficult. You know, that's it. You know, I I don't want to uh, you know I just want to you know give up and retire or something like that. And and I that's when the UN came out with a report, and they said in their report. 22.8 million Afghans might starve to death this winter, wow. including 1 million children might die. Why? Because all the businesses closed, 500,000 Afghans lost their jobs. Um, there's a famine, there's a drought, you know, there's US sanctions, um, US froze $9 billion of assets, humanitarian aid stopped, um, you know, all of these different circumstances all came at the same time. So I said, okay, You know, I, I've worked hard all these years, and this is the time when my country needs me the most. And if I walk away and I, you know, wash my hands and say, you know, forget it, you know, it's too difficult, you know, Afghanistan, you know, there's not even a flight, you know, what can I do? That's, that will be the biggest betrayal of all. And so wow. I said, no, this is the time I need to give it everything I've got. You know, just whatever saving, whatever time, whatever effort um, to, to not only not fire my own employees, but hire more people and try to figure out how I can help. And that's what I've been focusing the last six months on. You, you know what? It, it, you remind me something that for me was, wow, a life changer. In, in Harvard, three years ago, in one of the classes, one of the professors says, hey guys, as a white po -er, if you made something special in your own companies, the impact in the world is going to be amazing. And this is what we are doing. So instead of complaining, no, you have a possibility to impact so many lives as you have done so far. That is incredible. And it's true. And, and this applies not just to IPOers, to every single entrepreneur. So we really have the chance to change lives. And, and I think that another, another person, uh, uh, Luis Almagro, is the general secretary of the American uh, Organization of American State. He says something, one of the interviews, he says, Rick, to be a good leader, you first need to be a good person. And it's so true. Now let's jump in your mathematical thing. Your, let, let's go to the question to make a statistic. How old are you right now? Right now, I'm 39 years old. Oh my I'm God, 39 super young, super young. <laughs> okay, amazing. So uh, many things done I, so far. I'm okay. young, but I, what, what I learned from, from that is 
uh, especially from YPO and you know, the Harvard experiences that, that we have. Um, it's, it's, it's great. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the businesses and I'm proud of my family and I'm proud of that. But I, I really came about, you know, I'm getting to this, you know, the 40 age and I'm thinking, okay, this is, what, what do I want to really do in my life? Uh, you know, I, I don't need to worry about what to eat, what to do it. And it, it's really what YPO and, and what the, um, the, you know, the, these programs have, have helped me learn and, and realize is, uh, is, is what my mission in life would be. And that I, I came after, you know, a lot of uh, thought. It sounds simple, but it's to help the most number of people. So if I can look back and say I've made a difference in the, the greatest number of people uh, that I could possibly do it, then I, I would feel like it's a life, you know, well lived. And so anything that I can do, that's how I try to analyze opportunities. How much of a difference can I make in how many lives? If I'm going to do this opportunity, maybe it'll impact, you know, 10 lives. If I do this opportunity, maybe a million lives, then definitely I'm going to go to that. Even if it's not as, lit, as you know, uh, fruitful in terms of financial, even if it's not, uh, uh, you know, uh, easy, if it's the harder way, no, if it's the right way, and if it's a way to make a difference and help more people, then, then definitely that's the route I need to pick. Brother. God bless you, and for sure, it's going to make you more way happy. And by the way, your five kids are going to be great people just to see your example. So this is the way to go. Next question. Five kids, right? Five kids. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of kids. <laughs> we love a lot of the fathers. Okay. <laughs> then I have to. Then, um, okay. Every single day, uh, at what time do you uh, wake up? I wake up uh, at dawn, so it depends on what what dawn is. Um, so I'm I'm Muslim, and in my faith, we you know we pray five times a day. One of the times is right before dawn. So sometimes that's three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's four. Right now, you know, it's shorter days, so it's you know closer to six o'clock in the morning. So th that's the time that I wake up every day. So you, you you wait for the light, and when the light appears, you you will start making your prayer. This is how it works. Sure. Yes, exactly. So there's five prayers and they're all dependent on different times of the day. Um, one of them is at the first light. So it's not when you can see the sun, but just the first light. That's the first prayer. But, and is prayer it only... but you have an alarm or it's just that you open the window, so you, you see? Yeah, no, there's a, there's a schedule, there's an alarm. So you check, you know, what time does the sun come up? Um, what time, you know, is, is that prayer, the first prayer of the day? And then, then we do it. And so I wake up and then I wake up my, my four kids, not the fifth one, you know, but the fifth one is still a baby. So I wake up <laughs> okay. the four kids and, uh, uh, and we, uh, we pray together. It just takes, you know, two minutes, wow. but, you know, we're, we're thankful, you know, for what we have. And, and it's just oh, a, nice. a beautiful, wonderful way, you know, a grateful way you know, to start the day. Um, uh, as well, but, but you know what? This is another beautiful example. So I'm a Christian. You, you are a, a, what is it, a Muslim. Muslim. And yeah. we are brothers and we love each other and we have in some way the same goals in life and we're looking for, so I, I get God's good. So, it's, it's, so, so many times uh, crazy people use religion to make our fight and doesn't make any fucking yeah. sense. So it doesn't, so it doesn't make any sense so at all. At the end of the end, then at the end of the day, we are always, so we're trying to do the best and we are, uh, this pray, I think go to the same place in some way. So it, it's so, so nice, these things. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that. it really is, and and that's uh, I think you know one of the, the beauties you know, um, you know of the world is uh, is to understand that those commonalities exist. So my mother was actually Christian, and she converted, and so I grew up quite a bit with my mother's parents, my grandparents, and I went to church regularly on Sundays, and I was actually even a Bible camp counselor for some time. And <laughs> we're saying, you know, how you're a Muslim, how did you teach the Bible? And I said, oh, it's all the same stories, you know, Noah and the Ark and Moses, and you know, I love Jesus and. You know, if I don't love Jesus, actually, I'm not a Muslim. I have to, I have to love him. That's the only way. If I don't believe, you know, he was, uh, and, and so all of that, uh, you know, it helped bring the world a smaller place. And I think that's also one of the great things about YPO. It makes the world much smaller. You realize, actually, the similarities are much, much more than the differences. And the differences, people use it for their own advantage, but it's, it's not really there. What? Let me tell you something. I have maybe 90 interviews. I think this is the one that I love the most. It's, it's so beautiful. <laughs> this is so nice. This is so okay. Kind. Okay. Then, do you do exercise every every day, or how how, how often do you do exercise? Three times a week, I, I exercise. Um, and I used to do a program called F45. Uh, and when I went to Afghanistan, I missed it. So then I started my own uh, franchise of F45. It's an Australian company, really amazing, amazing firm. Um, similar to what you were saying with Sweat, uh, you know, F45. And so we started two in Afghanistan and we started four studios uh, in the US, just 
so much fun, you know, to, to get exercise. And it's the opposite of what people think. People think, you know, you exercise will make you tired, but actually exercise gives you energy. And so 100% and also, for sure. and also endorphin. So you, 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 be, you became happier when you finished exercise. So important exactly. for, also for the mind. But you know what? I also love that you are sharing, for example, that this system of, of these trainers at these gyms are almost the same of the U.S., And you have two in Afghanistan. So because yes. when we saw the news, for me, Afghanistan is like literally the war. <laughs> so bombs right now. Yes. And there is a life going on there uh, more than the, the, you know, the crazy guys fighting. So, yes. it's, it's so it's so important also, brother, to show that in your country, there are beautiful things happening at the same time. So it's like, a, you know, this... Because life go on and, and exactly. And, and Afghans, they, they do have a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so, you know, people wouldn't believe it, but, you know, just for fun, I would take out the team bowling and they're like, you have bowling in Afghanistan? Yeah, we have two bowling alleys. We have big water parks. You know, we have, you know, gyms, we have all sorts of amazing, amazing, uh, you know, entertainment and fun and life. And um, you can do so much there um, in Afghanistan, but people don't imagine it. They think, you know, it's a desert and there's bombs and people fighting. Exactly. And, you know, what are the people worried about? Well, they're worried about inflation, you know, just like in Venezuela. And they're worried about, you know, the price of fuel or the price of, <laughs> you know, this uh, or that. And what do they eat? Well, you know, they, they eat, you know, food just like you and I do. Exactly, exactly. But it's, uh, it, 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 is, um, uh, it is strange how much the media affects, you know, people's uh, you know, perceptions of what things are going on, um, you know, all over the world, uh, very, very different views of not only, you know, religion and people and countries and, and, and that, but, but also um, uh, even in terms of, uh, you know, no matter how much you try to think that you're open-minded, you still feel like sometimes you know, it's, it's that brainwashing going on. And so you have to fight against that norm. When everyone is headed for the exits, you have to say, oh, okay, okay, wait, you know, I'm not going to follow what everyone else is doing. Let me, let me you know, see 100%. for myself what's going on. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, do you have uh, someone that you admire during your whole life? It would be whatever, family, outside. There's one person that you, oh my God, this was kind of always my legend. Yes, uh, there's a person, his name is Hamza, um, Hamza Youssef, or um, his uh, early name was Hansen. Um, he's an American from California. Um, he now has a, um, he's the founder of a university called Zaytuna College. Um, and uh, he is just the most incredible person I've ever met. Um, and I've, I've, you know, met him. I've had the fortune of spending time with him. Um, and He, uh, you know, he tried to see what life is all about because he had a near-death experience when he was in his late teens. And then he tried to look at, you know, what, what should I do in life? What is the meaning of life? I was about to die. What was going to happen then? And this curiosity led him on a path that he went to Dubai and uh, uh, he went uh, um, uh, to, you know, many different countries, ended up 10 years in the desert of Africa, in Mauritania. And he had this incredible amount of experience and knowledge. And so... Just, you know, the amount of good that he tries to do for people in terms of education, in terms of trying to stop, uh, you know, stereotypes and try to helping people is, is just phenomenal, phenomenal. And so he's probably, you know, affected millions of lives, but a lot of people don't know about him uh, uh, as well. So I'm, I'm really, you know, a big proponent, uh, you know, of, of him. Um, when I was younger, uh, probably someone more like Mother Teresa was really, really great. You know, this selfless character that would go to, you know, uh, you know, other sides of the world. And my grandparents as well, I remember, you know, their version of Christianity was the same thing, helping people. And so we would spend, you know, days and days filling up, you know, bags with notebooks and papers and pens to send it to school children in Africa, or making packages of winter or all these different things. The more you do in charity, the more you can help other people that are less fortunate to you, that's the good deeds that you can take with you in the next life. Because we're all going to die. And so it's maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe, you know, 10 years from now, we don't know. But what the only thing that we can take with us is, is, is our actions. And so San, that, that what, is a young age. What, what, one book that you feel changed your life. One book that you remember like, oh my God, this is the one that I love. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a book called The Giver. Um, by Lois Lowry. And that book really made a difference uh, on me. And it, it showed a lot about, it was, I read it when I was very young, 
uh, but it showed how you know, systems are to control a lot of people. And back in Rome, that's, they, they said the way to control people is through food and circus. That's how you control people. You have cheap food, and then you have a lot of entertainment. And I feel like that's what the world has become now. People aren't really thinking about the big problems, about how to you know, change you know, things in the world, improve the lives of people. There's just so much circus going on, you know, from you know, whatever, Netflix and movies and game, video games and all this just entertainment that people are drowning in it. Um, and food, they have cheap, poor nutrition, fast food that are making people more and more unhealthy. So the same thing that they were used to control people in Rome, you know, back in the day, you know, with the gladiators, you know, with a lot of, you know, circus and pump. That's, that's what's happening to the world now, unfortunately. And so the giver made me show how people, you know, if you're not questioning uh, around you, not seeing, you know, behind the, the curtain, what, what's, what's really going on, um, then that you too are just going to be one of those, you know, uh, suckers, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's going to not realize and wake up, you know, from, from what's really happening. Okay, the last question, Sansar. If you need to give an advice, just one advice to the people that are listening, what should be this advice? Um, I think it's going to be a little bit further on what you said about being a good person, and that reflects in your family life as well. So if you can focus on your marriage, if you can, you know, they say happy wife, happy life. If you can focus on your parents, you know, serving your parents, if you can focus on your kids and raising them to be, you know, good human beings with empathy, that is then going to transcend everything else. That's going to, it, it, I've met people that are successful, if they're successful in their home life, especially, um, and, uh, and they're, they're good to their kids and they're good to their families and they're good to that, then everything else seems to work out. They, they have business, they have, you know, um, uh, you know, political, whatever it is. But once they, once, if they're terrible at home and they're a dictator and abusive with their own family or their kids or, or their own life, and they have, you know, these horrible things in, in, in their home, everything else is going to fail. It's going to fall apart. It's not going to do it because you need to reflect yourself and be, you know, change your own heart, right? And change your own self first and, and have that reflected to the people that are most important to you, most closest to you. Once you can do that, everything else will fall into, into its place. So that, that's where the focus needs to be. And one of the people that I met, uh, he's, people were asking, you know, how do I raise good kids and what do I need to do? And, and they said, don't worry about your kids. Focus first on your marriage. Focus first on your own uh, you know, self. Then they will learn from your example. And others around you, your business, all of that, they will see your, your sincerity and your genuinity um, and, your, and, your, uh, and your spirit and your soul. Um, and so that's my one bit of advice. Focus internally and everything else externally will fall into place. Sansar, I absolutely love this interview. I love you, brother. Thank you very much for your time. God bless you because what you're doing is amazing. You're a great human being, an amazing way pure. Thank you again, brother. Thank you so much, Ricardo. You're very, very kind. <laughs> I'm at your service and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Send a big hug. Take care. Thank you.